Hi, this is Simon Dennis, cinematographer of American Crime Story Impeachment, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hello and welcome to The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Simon Dennis, the director of photography for American Crime Story Impeachment. Simon, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is our third time, right? It is. You are a returning champion for sure. You're a veteran of the Go Creative show now. Um, That's and for, a hat trick. And for good reason, because you've got great shows and really interesting work. And there's a lot to talk to you about on this show as well. Uh, but before we get there, I just want to mention our sponsor today, MZ, Empowering Filmmakers. And of course, encourage you to follow us on your favorite podcast app, as well as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. All things Go Creative show at gocreativeshow.com. So, Simon, you are back. Now, I'm trying to think back. We've had you for, we had you for Hollywood. I think we had you for Ratchet too, right? That's right, yep. So you are very much embedded in this Ryan Murphy world. And um, you know, it really kind of is a world in and of itself. I mean, there's there's such a strong style to, to the Ryan Murphy um, series of TV shows that mm -hmm. I, uh, you, when you watch one, you always kind of know it's a Ryan Murphy project. However, there is something about American Crime Story, that whole series, there's something different about it. It has mm. it has almost like a, a more, I don't know if polished is the right word because it implies that the others aren't, but it has a different, it's almost like a more sophisticated look if that's the right word. I don't know how mm. to describe it, but I always kind of know that it's an American crime story and not one of the other series that he has. Am mm -hmm. I reading into it too much or is there actually something to that? I think it's, no, I think you're right. I feel like it's, when it's anything that Ryan does that's fact-based, I feel like there's a different nuance to the way he approaches it. And, you know, like Ratchet was a very much a, a, a completely more, more kind of expressive in a way, more kind of color coded and, kind of based around fashion and, you know, hair and makeup. And of course, this show is that too, but I think it's more like, it's more like pushed down, you know, like Versace, the assassinated Johnny Versace, which was the first show I did for him. It was very much like trying to tell it as truthfully as possible, you know? And I think that even though he has a lot of style and content and great sets, they feel a little bit more grounded. As grounded as you can be with Ryan, <laughs> but they're still elevated way above other shows. I feel like there's still, still a kind of a sweepingness to the whole, you know, to the show. It's it's kind of very grand. And this one was huge. It was sprawling three years, um, actually more than that, because the original catalyst of the story started in 1991 with um, Paula Jones and her harassment. So it's it's a uh, yeah. I think I think he he definitely treated this one. Um, in the same kind of tone and way of kind of keeping the crime story anthologies consistent, you know? It, it ultimately, it has to tell a true story. And if you veer off too, in too much of a stylized way or it's over-designed, then you kind of lose sight, I think, of what we're trying to portray of this, you know, this major event that happened. Well, that was something I wanted to ask you because you are portraying, not only is it a true story, but it's a story that lives in people's, it's an infamous, uh, inf what's the word? In <laughs> it lives in <laughs> infancy. I can't say the word, um, but people know that are listening. Um, yes. Infamy, that's the word. Infamy. Yeah. It, but it like, this is, this is, a worldwide giant story that impacted our country, impacted really the world when you think about it, because things that happen in the United States have kind of a ripple effect across the world sometimes. And this was just a massive story. And not only that, people have memories still, even though it's you know many years old mm -hmm. now, people have memories of some of those key moments. And when you're going into a show like this and you're basically recreating word for word some of these moments in history, how do you approach scenes like that? Um, do you have? Do you feel like an obligation to the audience to to reflect them accurately, or do you kind of take more creative license? What's What's the approach and what's the philosophy when doing something that's mm. so well known? That's a good question. Uh, well, listen, I was spoon fed uh, little sound bites when I was in England when this was happening, and we were told we were given uh, the exposure of the story was very, very much through the you know the press and the media. 
But this story, because it's Bill Clinton's scandal, and it's it's basically told through the eyes of three women, you know, Monica, Monica Lewinsky, Linda Tripp, and Paula Jones. And it's sort of, you. there's so much stuff that I was learning that was actually, because it's based on um, a vast conspiracy by Jeffrey Toomin, and Sarah Burgess was the brilliant writer on it. I feel like because it was a, because Ryan really pushed for a female perspective, I, I felt like as a DP, just honoring and being respectful to that. And I don't quite know how to answer your question about how to kind so, of so convey right. scenes. So let's say, for example, you've got the scene when he says, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, okay? Mm -hmm. That is something, at least in the US, that people remember. If you're old enough to remember that, that's sort of embedded in your mind. Um, yep. When you're doing something like that in the set design, in the wardrobe, in the casting, in the in the um, you know the the writing is all made to make this moment be as reflective of how it was in real life. How do you mm -hmm. approach that cinematically? Because you still have to infuse your style and your style into the show in a moment that really was shown through the news. Does that make sense? Mm. Well. To be honest, we went for the truth. We, I tried to replicate as close as we could to those key, key moments. I mean, that one particularly, the hug that um, he yes, gives her in the crowd. Exactly, the hug. They're, they're very iconic moments. And we actually, I just tried to photocopy, as it were, visually down to the, you know, down to the detail and the props and what have you. And these were key moments that we just try to play as accurate as possible. Because if you start, I feel if you start fantasizing or altering those kind of moments, I feel like you're in a little bit of a land of fiction, you know? I don't think people would sort of digest it as well. And I think, and that's that pretty much goes for the whole show, really. I mean, that's why I said earlier about uh, Ryan's, this one being a bit more grounded, is just being as kind of realistic as possible. And that came down to the lighting as well, which I felt like I was, on this show, it, it because we're we had one huge challenge of shooting uh, DC in LA. <laughs> um, that's a challenge. And I, I, that's a huge one. And um, basically, I was kind of drawn to um, uh, the the terminology North Light, which where I come from in England, you know, we get a lot of overcast. And I I felt like this was a daylight show and not a sunlight show. And we had obviously, you know, because we're portraying. DC and DC has been sort of not bastardized, but it's definitely been betrayed in that kind of cold look. Yes. Uh, you know, the movie traffic being one, it's kind of like a color coded city. It's like, Oh, we're in DC. But I think for this one, we were trying to go down a pathway of a bit more of like a gray look, a silver gray look. And like you said earlier, I think there's a feeling like we're almost drawing colors out than putting colors in uh, to the show. And um, I mean, Ryan came to me with, um, two major references, and that was like All the President's Men and Parallax View. So his his kind of take on it was to do like a 90s presidential affair, but film through like a 70s style conspiracy lens, mm. which again is a huge challenge because you're talking about a Nixon era and a Clinton era and kind of fusing them together. But when we started to get up and running and started shooting the scenes and and kind of getting almost that, that naturalistic light um, that I felt like DC and, you know, uh, was had had a great feel for, um, we were just keeping it more real. It was just more about um, simplicity than over, you know, uh, too much expressiveness. And that came from the camera as well. We we're co constantly trying to make the camera more restraint. I was, <laughs> it's a funny thing, because I was almost imagining what this show would look like if Alan J. Bakula had directed it, you know? And, it, you know, he's got that amazing ability to create tension and claustrophobia and he hardly moves the camera. It's it's a be beautiful thing to see. And of course, you know, he worked with Gordon Willis. And I was trying to, as well, do a little nod to Gordon. And if I can come 1% close to doing what Gordon did. Uh, but that was at the back of my mind too. And there was a funny thing. I was trying to, I, I, Ryan was really, really pushing hard, particularly to me. He was like, moody, moody, moody. Mm. And I, I was going, the challenge of doing mood over 10 hours is very, very, it's a, it's a thing that, could alienate the audience a little bit. So I came up with a term that I think the, that everyone felt happy with, and that was glam gloom. So <laughs> I love that. I, I was trying to create this huge balance of like making it gloomy um, when it needed. Of course, you know, it's a, it's a show of ups and downs. So there's definitely bright areas. We have stuff, we have the, the, um, 
what is it? The Newsweek offices that was this, you know, the bullpens that was our kind of version of the Washington Post. Yeah. So we were constantly like ebbing and flowing and copying or kind of playing in honor of the sort of Nixon era. But yeah, glam gloom was a thing that I just constantly kept kind of remembering on the day. Well, let's talk about both sides of that. So you've got the glam gloom. We'll start with the gloom because that's kind of what we've been talking about. And yes, you're mm. right. DC really does almost kind of get a bad rap in TV. I, I I almost feel bad for DC a little bit because it's such a beautiful city, but it's always yeah. represented in this dark gray, awful place. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I almost got some vibes of like um, House of Cards, not from not necessarily from like the camera movement or anything. I feel like their shots were really, really wide. And there was a lot of like static in that. And there was a lot of mm -hmm. like, the camera was just plopped there. And there was a lot of done in the blocking. But the color, the treatment of the color felt a little like early seasons of, um, of uh, House of Cards for me. Mm. And I think from a gloom standpoint, you guys certainly did a great job. It is devoid of color. Um, it also has that, uh, that um, claustrophobia like we discussed. But the glam, like how are you incorporating a glamour into the gloom. I, I I think that's such a great phrase. Good question. I got, I don't know if I can answer this in a it, Well, it's your it, term, it, so you it, have it's, to. <laughs> it's it was it was more like like I said earlier because it's a female perspective story and you know, Monica particularly I wanted to treat her respectfully and I wanted to keep a sense of um gloss to her world a little bit. And then you had this very different world, which was Linda Tripp, which, as you know, is played by Sarah Paulson, just complete, massive, a brilliant it's transformation. She had a very different world. When she came home, it was kind of drab and and very much claustrophobic and more, more about shadow and her sitting in her chair and smoking a silhouette lit by a, a television, you know. But Monica Walensky has this... Uh, you know this, this issued um, apartment that the that the government gave her the Watergate uh, apartments, and it has this big vast view. If actually it has a slightly uh, restricted view, but it still has this kind of like there's a world out there for for Monica, and I felt like that that was the balance of like the the kind of glam factor. Um, I guess was just it's a difficult thing to balance because you can't you want to make it feel real, but you want the actors. And the characters, particularly, to be um, appealing, mm. I guess is the word. And it was a very, it's a finite balance to do it. It's, it's a lighting thing, I think. It's, about, it's all about getting a little bit of light in the eyes to get a little bit of a sparkle. Because otherwise, if you go too down, it gets a little bit muddy and gloomy. And I just think it gets more depressing. Whereas I was constantly trying to kind of keep a, a balance of light and dark. So, so... Uh, f so you're attributing that kind of glam to the lighting side of it, add adding in a little bit of that light in the eyes. Can you talk mm -hmm. to me more about other ways that you're doing, uh, other things that you're doing lighting wise to kind of give the talent that that appealing look, even in a moment or in a scene that isn't necessarily appealing or an environment mm. rather? Well, we could take Bill Clinton, for instance. I, I always saw the moment that they first meet in the back office when she's, it was like her first day as an intern well, in our story. Um, I kind of always saw Bill as being kind of romantically mysterious. Like mm. whenever, if he walked into the doorway, he's almost just like, you know, kind of three quarter backlit in places. Um, so I didn't want to make him feel um, mysterious in a very dubious way. I wanted to kind of like, it, I wanted it almost to feel like what it was like for her to be in that moment and to almost be dazzled, you know, it's almost like he's just completely backlit. You can't, on, you know, see his face. We didn't go that extreme, but I felt like that was that, that there was respectful moments of making the love relationship between these two characters um, more mysterious, but kind of beautiful, mysterious. Whereas, like I said, Linda's world is much more drab and depressing, and, and it's like she's like she's just this crazy. You know, she's not crazy, Linda Tripp, but she's definitely, and she's misunderstood in many ways, but um, she definitely has her issues. <laughs> Whereas Monica was just an innocent girl as an intern in, in the White House. And yeah, she was thrust under the spotlight. I think each of their environments have some differences to them. And um, I'd like to talk to you about that. Like for instance, okay, you, you had mentioned that Linda Tripp's house, 
um, is very dark and gray and gloomy. And yes, that is true. But there's one moment when it's not, and it's that Christmas party. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I yeah. was like dazzled by how warm and transformed that place was. And, um, and I'm curious what the decision was to give that Christmas party such a warmth and such an allure to it. Because uh, it seems like, and there's still one episode to go for me, it seems like there that was the only time that that house ever had a warmth and uh, love mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. Well, I love that scene because it's, it's a double-edged scene because it's there's very much a sense of paranoia. And what we did was we, I tried to make it as we worked with the art department to make it as beautiful as possible, as many kind of fairy lights as we could around the place. And it's Christmas, but there's a, we basically drew a little bit from Roman Polanski in that sequence, particularly like repulsion and um, his kind of like paranoia movies, you know, like mm. the tenant and stuff. Whereas you're seeing it from um, Monica's point of view and it's like, point of view shot would go around the corner and, she, and Linda would just go out of view and then she'd go around the corner and she's not there. And yeah, that, that, so that I found it really interesting how everyone was having a great time drinking eggnog and, you know, having a beautiful Christmas experience. And there was this girl trying to have a serious conversation, trying to find a serious conversation with Linda. And um, so we really played on that. You might have noticed we used wider lenses in that sequence, you know, we're kind of in and wide with, with Monica. What does that do for the scene? Why'd you choose that? I just think it felt like uh, trying to kind of simulate what how, how paranoid she must have felt at that point in the story. Like the world I is think, so much bigger and more uh, like intrusive to her life than she imagined. Yes, yes. And, and you know, she's, we try to make her feel smaller and smaller in the scene. And um, we try to um, almost use, you know, the characters in the room to almost block and kind of it's like a metaphor she's trying to kind of climb through these people to get to linda and it's it feels almost like a a, a bad dream you know yeah you know yes. like a freudian dream it's almost like her feet would start sinking into the carpet you know we wanted that kind of feel. That's a great reference. And I actually, I think I'm like everybody that watched the show. After every episode, I immediately grab my phone and I'm like looking for the moments that were reflected in that episode. And I found some weird story. It's not a weird story. It's a true story, but it was strange for me is that Linda Tripp ended up getting married to a guy that owned like a Christmas store. And I, it, right. it was so weird because I'm like, they <laughs> after that episode, I'm like, what is the tie-in with Christmas? Why, why are they so upset? Like, why did that scene get mm -hmm. so bright? And it really was because she's obsessed with Christmas. <laughs> she yeah. just is. She loves it, um, which I thought was just kind of funny because it's like the one soft spot that she has <laughs> is this kind yes. of Christmas time thing. Um, the other spot that I want to talk to you about is in the White House. It seems like the White House has a general warmth to it, even at the most stressful moments for Clinton, mm -hmm. uh, for both of them, uh, Bill and Hillary, it seemed to have a warmth to it all the time. And at first I was thinking it was only when Monica was there and it was almost like her point of view, but even when she wasn't, there's a warmth in that White House. I'd love mm -hmm. to talk to you about that. If I'm, Is it true? Is it something you guys intentionally did and why? It was intentional. It, in fact, earlier on, there was discussions about uh, kind of the notion of like if Monica walked into the White House, it just it, she lit up the room, you know, and it felt like fuzzy and warm. And again, like I said earlier, this 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 the whole sequences that take place in the White House, particularly in the Oval Office and the back study where the affair happened. I never felt like it felt like it should be played true. We definitely went through different seasons. You might have noticed there's some slightly cooler moments because we were in, you know, September and other scenes were in October and April. And um, so we were we were constantly trying to keeping it. I mean, the, the, the actual White House itself has a warm tone just just naturally. But particularly the back office, I wanted to make it feel a little bit romantic and warm and kind of cozy. Mm. Um, and I wanted to, to feel that um, that they were comfortable in their world, that there was this secret affair that was happening. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think it's it was generally for us color coded as a warmer environment over the kind of gray sort of uh, kind of dead light of the Pentagon. You know, the Pentagon felt like this kind of hellish fluorescent nightmare. 
Mm. Um, the you know the bureaucracy of like working in those ball pens and and you know having yeah just a really drab lifestyle. So I, where I, f- I I felt that the White House would be a different world for Monica, and and definitely yeah as you say warm. Yeah, because she's basically trying to get back into the White House almost the entire mm-hmm. season. So you had to have that contrast. And I think I think you handled the the um, Pentagon very very well. I mean I have no idea what it looks like in real life, but. The impression that I have of it based on just the exterior is that it is this kind of cavernous, maze-like environment that is not a place you really want to necessarily be <laughs> and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. filled with just activity and people and that 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 starkness of it. I mean, that's what it looks like from the outside. And I think you portrayed that very well on the inside and also that like outside area where everybody went to like hang out and smoke and stuff, that little mm-hmm. outside alleyway. Um, the the Pentagon was always interpreted as a downgrade from working at the White House by both Linda Tripp and um, Monica Lewinsky's characters. So how do you reflect that in the cinematography to make it feel like a place that is important, but you also don't really want to be there? Well, it to me, it, it, I mean, it was described in the script. The first moment that you walk into the the Pentagon, uh, it was described as like a, a flu- like I said earlier, fluorescent hell. Um, it was a tricky one to kind of get a balance of because it's effectively a massive shoebox where where it has like effectively flat lighting. So the 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 thing for me was to try and get the keep the balance of contrast in that space so it didn't feel constantly drab. Mm. I mean, we had conversations with production saying, "Do we have any different sort of times of the day inside this place?" And I felt like after speaking with the production designer and stuff, uh, Jamie is that it shouldn't feel like you almost don't know what time of day it is. Even though you have a row of windows, you have no concept of time. There's no clocks on the walls. So mm-hmm. that was one thing for me is to try and like make it feel like uh, to not even just basically come up with one look and just hope hope that the storyline will play through in, um, in, in still an entertaining way and, and not kind of bore people. Because that was the dichotomy of the, the Pentagon is like, it would feel like this all the time. And so does that come out as entertainment for us or does that come out of just the more you are in there, the worse it feels, which I I was hoping would be the case. And I think you achieved it, but that actually brings up something different that I, uh, that I'm sort of interested in is this, like, does it worry you when you go into a scene like that, when it is something that doesn't necessarily have a time of day and it kind of is supposed to look the same all the time. Um, are you concerned that it's just not going to hold people's attention? I mean, it sounds like you were a little bit concerned about that. I was, but um, ultimately, you know, it, it, the irony was that when you were actually in that set, it was like I completely, f- the more and more we were shooting, basically, the more and more I felt like I was one of the characters in one of those offices. I How was do you like, mean? Oh, my God. Well, I felt like trapped. I felt like I, was, I just wanted to leave this place. It's <laughs> just kind of like go shooting. Home. Yeah, it's just kind of like, oh my God, what would it have been like to be at work here, you know, day in, day out, month in, month out? Um, so in that way, I knew psychologically if I was getting affected like that, then I think that I was putting faith in um, the longevity of the show of like capturing people's imagination by by actually playing with the blandness, actually over blanding everything. It was just like, I mean, the producers were like talking about, they loved the, the fact that it was, it's almost making bland, uh, shabby chic. You know, it's like it's like a bland it's, glam. It's 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 bland glam, but it's like it's <laughs> Ryan's bland. It's like it's so over the top bland that it's like, oh my god, yeah. Remind me to never get a job at the White you know, at the Pentagon. <laughs> um, you know, like hospital dramas must deal with this. You know, a lot. You know, that, that it's very challenging to do. Um, uh, kind of fluorescent lighting um, and make it appealing. And also not going down the route of the kind of green fluorescent look that yeah. is quite popular. I guess you mentioned House of Cards has a slight thing yep. of that, I, I do recall. It definitely has its place, but I felt like still kind of channeling down this kind of gray gray fluorescent, you know, rather than like a color fluorescent. So when you go into a show, this show, any show, is part of what you're looking for is uh, environments where you can be a little bit more expressive with time of day and things like that, just to bring some variety to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the White House, we de- we had a document that we carried around with us, which was the the actual t- the timeline of events, including the um, 
the actual month and the year. So we were kind of building this kind of uh, time map where uh, I was I had various different modes set in the particularly in the Oval Office um, to denote a different time period. Uh, some of it was done through live color on the day because I had live color um, on the show, which kind of gave me the ability to shift colors if I needed to. But we were trying to achieve most of that in the set. So there was like one scene that I remember that where Betty comes into the office and talks to her about Monica wanting to come back and see him. And I just, it, it felt like a time of the year where it was like almost like borderline summer. So we had this kind of like warmth coming into the Oval Office. And then we kind of dabbled with other times of the year and went kind of more, most desaturated cool, you know? Um, it's, it was a very expressive set. And again, I, it's been portrayed in movies over the years as pretty much a one note location. You know, it's always that sunlight coming in through the windows. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of movies like clear and present danger and, you know, it's just, it has this very, um, kind of uh, one note look, but I, I felt like for this show, I felt like trying to um, just ebb and flow the looks based on the, you know, the time of the year, which was a very complicated thing to do. Cause you know, if you're shooting upwards of say 120 scenes in that room, which we did, there could be one way to say, well, let's do the Pentagon thing and just kind of keep it one note. But I felt like trying to ride those, those timelines and, and keep it more interesting and varied. Yeah. Let's take a quick break and talk about MZ empowering filmmakers. Now, you want to think about MZ as the Netflix of filmmaking education, and that's because it is loaded with high-quality video-based filmmaking education covering all the topics that we need to know here at Go Creative Show, including directing, cinematography, post-production, visual storytelling, and more. It is the place to go to hone your craft in filmmaking. So check it out at gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ, M-Z-E-D. Now, of course, it's not just about the courses. It's also about the, uh, the educators. Like, that's the whole thing is that the, the teachers need to be high quality, and they certainly are. I mean, we're talking about uh, Vincent LaFerre, Shane Hurlbut, Philip Bloom, uh, Tom Cross, the editor of La La Land, Whiplash, and No Time to Die. They're all on there as well as many, many others. These are educators working in the field. They are A-list. They are top of their game, and they are teaching you their craft, and it's all there at MZ. So check it out for yourself. Go to gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ, and uh, at the coupon code, if you type in GCS20, you get 20% off of your purchase, whether you're buying an individual course Course, or becoming a member of MZ Pro, which is really what's going to give you that Netflix model, becoming an MZ Pro member. So it's all there at gocreativeshow.com forward slash MZ, MZ, empowering filmmakers. One thing I noticed with this show is that there really isn't a clear villain the whole time. Mm. It's it sort of jumps around. It's like people have villainous moments. People have moments when they do terrible things. But I think the show does such a good job of almost making you relate a little bit, even to Linda Tripp, who's who really is probably the most, maybe the most villainous, just because of how what, you know what she mm -hmm. did to Monica. But it's like everyone is a little bit of a villain. Everyone is a little bit of a hero. It's kind of it's just so extraordinarily human that you relate to everybody at points and you hate mm -hmm. everybody at points and you love everybody at points. It's kind of all over the place. Um, yeah. But I think for the most part, every one of these main characters you feel for at some point, knowing that that's the way that, you know, this show is going to be, that it's not going to have a clear villain that you follow throughout all 10 episodes. Does it change the way you shoot them and film them? Because you know that there are moments where the audience should and sh need to kind of understand them. Yeah, good question. I mean, the show... I mean, just on relation to these characters, the show is about two things to me. It's about the abuse of power and betrayal. And, and you know, let's take Linda Tripp, for example. She's a very gray character in a way. She's very misunderstood. She's quite complex. Um, you could perceive her as being the villain, but, you know, only because she was somebody that taped <laughs> phone conversations with one of her friends thinking she was doing the right thing. Um, I mean, regarding lighting them, I, I kind of... Didn't really. I was kind of more like lighting the environment rather than the kind of characters. It mm. felt like um, 
too big a story to try and get into nuances of kind of getting into villain lighting or anything like that. I felt like they were lit by their own environment rather than the environment lighting that, you know what I mean? It felt like we're at Linda Tripp's house. It's designed in a very specific way to have shutters on the window. You feel trapped in there and she's trapped in her little world. And so is Monica in a way. She's almost trapped in her little bubble. And I felt like the production design was very much kind of a big part of that and how the story spans many locations and what have you. So I felt like it was more like photographing the rooms rather than the faces. Does that make sense? It does. It sort of, I didn't feel like there should be any shifts other than the times of year in the sets or in the locations and just let it play out more naturally. I felt, yeah. Now, that's kind of an interesting approach, uh, lighting the room and not necessarily the character. Not that you're not lighting the characters, but I understand mm. what, what you mean. Um, I think there are some moments, though, where decisions are made in the camera movement and some more of the extreme angles. Like there are definitely times when the camera's low and, you know, there's a group. It, I, I, I don't know how to describe the moment, but when Monica was kind of held in that hotel and she's surrounded mm. by all the FBI agents. Um, yeah. You definitely do feel like there's a there's a con, there's a control balance there, and you're sort of shooting up at all of the men in the room, but mm -hmm. and they're like trying desperately to get her to do what they want, and she's really not doing it. And there's there's kind of a there's an there are moments when I think you're implying that certain people have power over the scene through yeah. camera motion and through you know angles and things like that. I'd love to talk a little bit more about uh, about that and sort of the techniques that you used there. Uh, it, it was fascinating because earlier on in the shooting, um, in fact, in prep, in preparation for the camera test and stuff, we found out that Panavision had, we believed, as uh, Gordon Willis's uh, split diopter system from all the president's men. No way. The, the actual <laughs> you, system? Well, I believe it was. They said it was. And so we took this on the road and we, I tested it as well. And it's, a, it's an old school sliding, a map box sliding system. And the attention was to thread in some split diopter work as 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 it's so well used in All the President's Men. There's very, very famous moments in that movie that are just spectacular, and, and it's all about the use of split diopter. And it also creates a, a, an unusual sense of paranoia uh, and partially, you know, claustrophobia in a weird way. But um, we were shooting a scene where we were trying to convey somebody eavesdropping uh, on a conversation in the next office, and we were not quite getting the tone and my operator said, well, what if you use the split diopter? And I said, well, it's not that kind of shot. And, but we put the split diopter on. And if, if you know what I mean by this, I went wide open with a lens and it completely blurred the line, but it created this amazing sense of focus. Yes. Uh, and, and I ended up calling, like, calling it the sensory lens because when there was moments, particularly there was moments that you mentioned there with, um, Monica in the Ritz Carlton Hotel, and we used it. We used that device and that technique to almost completely like crush her. You know, mm -hmm. like um, there's a there's a feeling like we're bearing down on her. Or we're almost like two inches f from her face. And but we also used it in other areas of the show where you know L Linda was kind of eavesdropping too. And there's just a sense of unusualness to it so we, we sort of by not by accident but we, we had it we had an intention to use split, split diopter but it, uh, it, but it ended up becoming uh, used in a different way it, but we found it really effective we found it was a great language um that ryan particularly loved and he loved to use it you know when vince foster kept, there's a, there's a vince foster scene where he commits suicide we used it in that to, to again uh, create a sense of unease and um it's not like dreamlike. It's 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 kind of got a peculiar feel, and, and you can get this effect with through its um, shift and tilt, tilt lenses. But we we use that a lot, and that particularly that scene with uh, Monica in the in the Ritz Carlton that was that was a good use of it. And I know that Ryan was particularly conscious of trying to make these FBI characters feel larger than life, you know, yeah, physically and photographically. I love the use of that. I sort of had, I sort of thought it was a split diopter, but it's it's it, it's not a traditional yeah. use, so I wasn't one hundred percent sure. But it's yeah. interesting to to hear that it was. And I so the effect that you got that kind of super blurred line mm -hmm. was just keeping the camera wide open. So I yeah. so 
I guess alternatively, my impression now after hearing that is that usually the the quote like proper use or traditional use of a split diopter is to close up a little bit so it's a little bit more in focus. That's right. You have to actually do the opposite. You have to shoot deep. Or there's a, there's a fine balance between split diopters to make the line disappear but still be um, kind of visible in a way. I mean, D Brian De Palma used them a lot, as you know, in his movies, and they're they're very stylized techniques. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a science, and it takes it takes a little bit of time to get right, and you have to bury the line somewhere in the frame so it doesn't feel like it's a it's a it's a filter effect. Um, there's the scene in All the President's Men where Robert Redford's on the phone, and I think it's one continuous shot, and in the background with where Nixon is on the on getting reelected and um, and he's on the phone and it's 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 a. Uh, it's an amazing, you know, amazing moment. And I I, I kind of try to honor that in places. We did use actual split diopter moments of, say, a telephone in the in the right in the yeah. right hand side of the frame when Linda comes in and she picks it up and, and answers. So yeah, it's it was a great it's a great kind of uh, technique. You guys did a great job of not really overusing it either. Like it's so it's it's so helpful. Every time it's being used, it really helps enhance mm. the feeling of that moment. So I, I think it, those seems like one of those tools that you can, especially when you're shooting over the course of weeks and weeks and months and months, you almost like forget when you used it last and it's a tempting yeah. tool because it looks so cool. Um, it's something that I think could kind of draw you in to almost overuse it over the course of an entire show. But I think you guys yeah. did a great job of restraining from that. Um, what did you right. film on? We shot on the Sony Venice and I shot with uh, Panaspeeds. So- uh, How'd you come to that? Just testing. I um, I was I, I kind of knew I needed lenses. Um, they're very fast lenses, so they give you a, a variance of looks. You know, depending on deep focus and you know more. Again, like I said earlier, with the split diopter of using a more of a stylized uh, wide open thing. So, um, no, I, I felt like I was trying to simulate in honor of like the seventies. You know, um, all the presidents' men parallax view. Clute was in there. Hmm. And I felt like just trying to, um, you know, we. I think I talked to you about this before on Ratchet and even on Hollywood. Is that I underexpose the roar of the image quite a lot to kind of just keep keep a nice, rich kind of negative, as it were. So along with that and these lenses, I felt like it was a good match for the show. What other cameras did you test? Um, the LF. Um, but ultimately, I felt like the Sony was winning, even even in the color space. I felt like, again, you know, I, I always knew that there would be, even if the final show was going to be almost, almost a desaturated look, there is still very much color design. So I felt like this, this camera was much more sensitive and expressive in the kind of color space. And I kind of like the camera for that. I'm very, still very surprised this day because it's... It's so it's a, it's always it's always been known with the Sony cameras to be a little bit plastic with the color space, but mm. I just love what this camera does, and it has a dual ISO. So if we get into low light situations, we can we're good, you know. I, I've seen such a shift towards you know a list directors of photography like yourself. I, I've seen a shift in their impression of what the Sony you know color science can can do. Just over the course of the past five years, um, just hearing stories on this show too, it's like, I think a lot of people are more open to it now than they were, um, certainly now that the Venice is out. But even, it, it took a couple of years even for the Venice to kind of catch hold, mm -hmm. I think for, mm -hmm. for some people. People have an impression of Sony as almost being like very, um, like clinical in it. It's it's like, it's so precise, it's so sharp, it's so clinical, it, it sort of lacks the human uh, skin tones or, or the the mm -hmm. response to human skin tones. I feel like that impression is going away, it's, and pro probably because it's it's getting better. <laughs> so yes. it's not just an impression; it's it's no longer the case. Yeah, and if it if it works, you know, it works for me. I mean, it, I I kind of you know I would take that on the road on every show if I could. Mm. Um, but of course, you know, every show you've got to test the the right camera for the right job. You know, exactly. Did you play with any filters on this show? We did. We used. We I test again. I did a bunch of testing, and I knew I needed uh, going back to the glam gloom thing that I had. I knew that I wanted to have like a softer roll off in the highlights, um, 
And that was one of the other things, you know, speaking earlier about the glam gloom look and you were asking about how you balance that look of being moody but kind of glossy is that we ended up using uh, black frosts, which are effectively, you know, a, 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 a filter system that kind of glows just the highlights and it kind of keeps the mid-tones retained and healthy. And so, you know, you might have been conscious of that in the show, maybe not. I mean, it you know, as long as you felt like... Um, you felt like earlier, like it has that balance of gloominess, but glam, glam in us, <laughs> you yeah. know, then, then that's what those filters were doing for us. I mean, on, on Ratchet, they had the Mitchells on before that on Hollywood, we had uh, the Hollywood black fr- magic uh, filtration. They all basically do the same thing. They all kind of curve off the highlights to give it more of a pleasing look. And rather, rather than going with very hard uh, highlights and, you know, details and windows and stuff. It's something that we've always kind of constantly battled with, I guess, with these the, the digital cameras. Like you say, they're so clean. Yeah. Well, the whole show looks very soft. I mean, I think, mm. honestly, I think the only time that I noticed that the light wasn't cloudy, I guess, for lack of a better term, or just kind of soft, was um, it's, I think there's a shot of Monica getting out of a car and walking up into the courthouse. And it, it, uh, that's the only time that I actually noticed that there were harsh shadows like anywhere in the whole right. series. I feel like that might yes. have been episode eight or nine or something. It was recent. Yes. And that was the only time that I got that feeling of like, okay, there is a sun in this world. <laughs> like it's actually, there's a bare there sun is. somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't ideal for me. Cause like I said earlier, I wanted to try and live this in a North light kind of environment. I didn't want, you know, I mean, Ryan was actually very big on this. He was like, I don't want any sunlight in this show. And I knew straight away that we were going to constantly are going to have moments of challenges with that, particularly in a big open broad space where you're in LA. It's but I we have to say we did get really lucky in a lot of places oh, yeah. on exteriors, super lucky. Uh, it's almost like when we needed it to be overcast, it was overcast. But when, in fact, that moment you speak of when she comes out of the car and up the steps, I feel like that's a great moment, and it it, it felt right, you know, to oh, have awesome. the sun behind her, you know. Um, but we were, I was constantly trying to plan stuff around hopeful overcast, which is impossible really in LA. You can't plan for it. Even if you get a prediction on the weather, it's still, you know, it's, it's never what you think it's going to be, but, uh, yeah, we get, we got lucky when we needed to. I want to talk about, uh, something you mentioned earlier in the show is this idea of claustrophobia in, in the series. And, um, I think you're 100% right. There, there's a tension throughout this entire show and this feeling of like, you just can't get out. Like, mm. and, and I think the episode that that exemplifies that the most is the one when Monica is trapped in that hotel room in the Ritz. Like it, especially since it's even, they even have this, understone, uh, this undertone of the fact that yeah, she could leave, but she couldn't at the same times. And I feel mm. like that episode is so stressful to watch. And it's, just, it's so like aggravating to watch. You're like, mm. oh my God. Cause you think if I was in this situation, you think to yourself, oh, I would just leave. But then you realize you, you really wouldn't because you don't, you, you, you don't really know what's, what's going on. Like it's this big feeling of confusion and yes. it's scary and you can't leave. And even though you're in this beautiful, large environment, you still feel trapped. And I think the mm-hmm. whole series felt like that but especially that episode. So right. talk to me about some of the things that you're doing to give that feeling of claustrophobia. Well, actually, it's a good question. And um, what we ended up doing was every location and every set, I would ND the windows. So basically up to three stops. Normally, mm. you let the windows glow a little bit to be a bit more expressive but actually on every single location particularly we were we were bringing the windows down so i wanted to try and use that device of of having a darker window or a more neutralized window to feel more trapped and there's lots of window treatment in the show so it's almost like you can't see out Mm. you're trapped in you know there was shears on the windows at the the ritz colton but you can't quite see out you know there's the frosted windows of the Pentagon, but you can't quite see out. There's never this view of the outside world. And you're right. And hopefully we did a good job on kind of, um, by, you know, using this technique to create more of a overall claustrophobic feel. And it still comes down to this kind of glam, sorry, gloom factor that we, we were trying to keep the whole show suppressed. And that's something that you don't normally do. Uh, you know, you talk to the grips and they have to cut window, you know, gels to the windows for every single location. 
But it was a formula that I got up and running earlier on. And, you know, before I knew it, when we were going on to another location, they'd already get all the windows ended. And so it felt like, um, yeah, a lot more, lot more kind of like um, less of a summer feel, more of a winter kind of hibernation feel, like everything's hunkered down. Is there anything in the camera package or the lens package or the way you move the camera that also helps support this feeling of claustrophobia? Um, I felt like it was more like more of a restraint with camera movements. I know that Ryan used a lot of camera movements and cranes and steady cam in the first episode. But I felt like it was um, more about what you don't move and what you do move, and like like using lighting and tone and mood to convey. There was a lot of uh, TV scenes in this show, and uh, we built these purpose-built like uh, l- uh, light boxes that would fit onto the TV and simulate the output of a TV. So it was actually. Uh, sometimes the only light source that was integrating into the set. And mm. I like that kind of use of um, using the media and using the kind of the image of a television that's kind of like feeding you information as being a, a light source in a room. It wouldn't normally feel like that, but we I, I use that more and more. So I think it was probably a combination of like more restraint and camera angles using good kind of strong compositions and playing on mood. Those light boxes, did you just throw them into an old television set? No, we we actually patched them right into the front of the actual television uh, oh. when we were actually not when sometimes when it was in view, but mostly when it was off camera to kind of give a, a sense of um, um, you know light source in the space. Um, yeah, but we ended up th- we we sort of invented like three or four of them because. We're using them so much, and we were kind of like getting the the algorithm better and better as we were shooting. Um, but I knew that was kind of another voice in the show, as it were, of light. Yeah. What do, What would you say is the most um, the most challenging scene to do? That was a while ago for you, I'm sure. <laughs> um. God. Um. Let me think. I ask this question to a lot of DPs, and it's most of the time the answer is like this really small random scene. You'd think it'd be something like a big action sequence or something like that, but it oftentimes it's like the most simple scene took the longest for some reason that no one ever expected. Did you have any moments like that? Well, one stands out, and that's the grand jury testimonial scenes, which we... we, um, And I mentioned this because... It's like, uh, and I knew we were coming down this road and getting closer and closer to it, and it's the whole courtroom language that is sort of been, um, it's a very, very tough thing to get right as a balance. You know, you've got the angles on the jury, you've got the angles on Monica, you've got the questions. And this, there's, there's, there was upwards of 23 minutes, I think, on screen. And I was, my, the challenge was just keeping it, you know, um, Keeping it fluent, but not getting boring or stagnant, you know? Um, yeah. So there was lots of, I think that was a three camera day and it was shot over three days. And That was kind of was an just, unusual setup for the jury too. I don't think I've ever seen a jury pool separated like that. It was right. it was weird. It yeah. was almost like, um, like stadium style seating mm-hmm. instead of all of them in a little box. Um, right. It was, ju- it was unusual. I don't, I, I was, I've just figured it was a, a, an accurate representation of that particular room, but yeah, I've never but seen I, anything like it. I like it because it's almost like the gods are there and she's yes. on trial, you know, and she's this, and we tried to use the space as well, like to cr- try and get as wider angles as we could to make her feel so small in frame compared to this, you know, you know, these 12 eyes on her. <laughs> and she was, she, and, and again, we use the split diopter thing effect for the close ups on her to make it feel more pressured and claustrophobic. Um, but that that was one uh, that was one of many scenes I would say that was a challenge to kind of keep uh, interesting and, and also cre- keep emotionally engaged, you know, and pe- perspective driven as well. You know, you've got this sense of you want to be on both sides of the line. You want to be on the jury's perspective of what their experience of what they're listening to the story of you know what Monica's telling them and and also Monica's perspective. And those were mostly done through you know tight angles on her, but 
looser angles back through onto the jury and stuff like that. I wanted to ask you about filming the um, the frozen meals in the, in oh. the potato in the microwave. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, did you, I'm thinking, I'm like, did Simon actually have to sit there and film all these frozen meals? Or is that like something that gets handed off to second unit? There's just uh, so many like of these random shots or, or the cassette tape rolling around in a, um, in a like a recorder right. and things yes. like that. I'm thinking like, is that, is that something that gets handed off to a second unit? Or does the DP actually sit and, and fret about the exact placement of all of that stuff? Some of it did, but actually a lot of it we had you know, we shot, I mean, there's a lovely scene where she's just watching a, a baked potato turn around in the microwave. <laughs> and Ryan particularly gets really excited by these moments because it's it's like I said earlier about finding a fascination in, in the mundane, you know? He's like, he went really over the top of that. It's just like, she's just like a zombie staring at the, uh, that. But the ready meals, they were all very much character driven through, through Linda Tripp's kind of scenes and- yeah. They were everywhere, you know, and and particularly like you're saying, the uh, the tape, the taping, the cassettes, all those details. We we did. Uh, Lynn, um, Sarah Paulson insisted on doing all of her own handwork, so wow. it was all accurate. I mean, that actual hot, that episode, the telephone hour, where it's got all the, te- the phone conversations. I love that episode because it was a challenge to do a you know what would be effectively forty five minutes of people talking on the telephone, which you think would be completely boring. Um, we work really hard to kind of like sh- uh, get, uh, you know, make, do all the coverage. You know, we brought in a special um, sp- um, boroscope lens system to get all the kind of like. What is that? In- it's like a telescope lens, uh, has a miniature lens system at the end. And it basically enables you to, they were quite big in the 90s for commercials where you wanted to move the camera through. Say, oh, is that uh, like the long, it's box. like a long tube? It's, it's that, like a snoot, yeah. Uh, that's okay. That's the yeah. that's. So, what did you call it? The some. The, it's a boroscope. It has various boroscope? names. Yeah, okay. boroscope system, and we use that to do all these stylized inserts of the cassettes and you know the passing of time and lighting of a cigarette and stuff like that. So, no, I think we were constantly trying to you know shoot the mundane <laughs> because it, it's <laughs> it's all a part of the story. It's all there. It's all on the page, and it's not stuff that you know you could end up on the cutting room and floor. But actually, that's what made um, that's what you know was a reflection of Linda's character. <laughs> yeah, it who really was very was. misunderstood. It, it, I I the the now I I was. When did this all happen? This was like kind of early '90s, so I was I was a very young teenager throughout this whole thing when it happened in real life, and I couldn't care less as a young teenager about what was going on in the news. However, you couldn't help but know certain key moments and certainly learn about them as you as you age. But I was surprised just how big of a role Linda Tripp was in this. Like that, yeah. that was the, I think that was the biggest takeaway for me. And what I'm sort of searching every time an episode ends is like. I had no idea how much of this story really was Linda Tripp because when you when you heard about the sh- the shoot being um, happening when you first heard that it was greenlit and it was happening, you think it's going to be all about Monica and yes it is, mm. but I feel like Linda Tripp was really the 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 story seemed to revolve around her more than I ever thought, which I thought was really mm. interesting because I knew that Monica was so deeply involved in this show and I I kind of wanted to wrap up our conversation about. How much involvement did the real people have, the people that were actually involved in this? How much involvement did they have in the making of this uh, series? Well, Monica, for sure. Um, You know, when it comes down to, you know, Bill Clinton and, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that he won't be watching this show. I can imagine. Uh, And then, but sadly, Linda passed away last year because we were due to shoot in March. We were about two weeks away from shooting. And of course, you know, the pandemic hit and everything was put on hold. And then we resumed in uh, mid-October. Was she involved uh, at all in pre-production or in any way? I believe not. No, no. I mean, I'm not sort of privy to these, to this sort of, these kind of things in a sense of um, who... You know, because it is a very uh, sensitive, you know, story. And, and I dare say people wanted to be portrayed accurately. And it's funny, whenever you see a little... In fact, yesterday I was re-watching an interview with um, 
with Linda Tripp in her you know later in life when she had like plastic surgery and she was all glamorous. Yeah, is that it's just it's just scarily uncanny how how close Sarah Paulson performances to that and she you know like you said earlier she's she's not a villain she's not a monster she's very misunderstood and sarah's amazing at playing these very complex characters that have very complex mechanics and emotions and and i thought she played her beautifully and it, it, it's it's almost like every everyone was on set going what is linda gonna do now you know what is she <laughs> gonna do today because it's just like watching a car crash. You're like, oh my god, this this can't be happening. <laughs> but you know, uh, you know. But I'm, Monica I'm hoping- was. But Monica was, and it's well reported that she was very much involved. I think she gets a, an executive producer, or producer credit on the show, so she was Correct. involved. Did you work with her at all? Did she appear on set at all? No, she worked with the the team, the writing team, and and you know the production and producers a lot. She was on set a couple of times, but very much. And she was very gracious and lovely and met the crew. But for, she was very much backstage and uh, a part of, like, the creatives, as it were. So I, I only met her briefly. But I do know, you know, if you there was a couple of interviews that came out with her on uh, where she was just, you know, she wanted this to be as faithful as possible and, and ride that fine balance of telling, you know, the perspective between three females, you know, I mean, what people don't know is that Paula Jones's story that went right back to the start of the sexual harassment uh, back in 1991, that was the catalyst almost for all these things to happen. And, um, you know, and so, like, there was so much about this story that I've, you know, we don't even know about. All we know about is the famous sound bites and what the media decided to show, you know, exp- exposed to us. But um, yeah, she, Monica was yeah she was involved heavily, and she she um, she's I'm I'm told very very del- you know very very happy with the show. That must make you feel good. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's it, it's it's just a great story. The series is fantastic. It's so well shot. It's so well acted. It's great. I mean, it's everything you expect from a Ryan Murphy project. It's everything you expect from an American crime story, and it mm-hmm. delivers on all fronts. So it's I believe the final episode is tom- uh, Tuesday. Right, Tuesday. coming up. Yeah. So um, by the time you hear this episode, the entire series will be available. So please go and check it out for yourself if you haven't already. It's just such a great. It, it's just interesting to see kind of when culturally our world got its first real explanation of like power dynamics. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't think it was explored as much as it was in the early '90s because of this scandal. This this idea of power dynamics. Um, it it. And I think the show does such a great job of honoring what that moment in history has or how that moment in history has changed the way we are as a, as a world, yeah. as a society. It's, it's such a great story. You, you did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what's next for you? What are you working on now? Uh, I'm in Atlanta and we're about a week away from shooting Candy uh, for Hulu, which is a true story of uh, Candy Montgomery, who uh, was a church going uh, wife with a perfect life in the suburbs of Texas. And uh, she bludgeoned her best friend, Betty to death with an ax (laughs) effectively. Uh, Horrible to laugh at it, but my God, what a story. And and true story. It was in 1980s Texas. And uh, so we're, we're kind of gearing up for that. And it's, you know, another thing for me to do another true event, true story. And, you know, I can get my teeth into that. And it's just, yeah, it's a fascinating one. I think we're going to maybe go down a slight Fargo route. So it's a very dark story, tonally, aesthetically, but uh, has a little bit of a funny bone to it, you know? Well, we are looking forward <laughs> to that. And of course, you're on Instagram as well. Uh, you want to plug that real quick for the people so they can find you on there? Yes. Uh, oh. You don't I know don't, your name, do you? <laughs> do, <laughs> I'm trying to remember my Instagram thing. I think it's just Simon Dennis DOP. That is awesome. I think, <laughs> I think we spoke about this before. I'm not a big, you know, PR, you know, as, you know, person. But, there uh, you are. Yeah. You're, you're Simon Dennis underscore BSC. <laughs> That's right. There you go. I know my own work. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> so, Simon, thank you so much for joining us. And let's have you back for your next project. You need, you need to come again. You've done three times now. We got to make it a fourth. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'd love to, Dan. Love to. 
All right, I want to thank Simon Dennis, the director of photography for Impeachment, American Crime Story, for coming on the show and talking to us all about his experiences. We learned a lot today, didn't we? Now, of course, we want you to reach out to me and let me know what you think of this episode. If you have any additional questions for Simon, we'll certainly forward those on to him and would love to know your thoughts on the show. I also want to thank Connor Crosby for uh, producing the show and making it all work. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, follow us on your favorite podcast app, as well as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Search Go Creative Show. You'll find us, subscribe to us, like us, love us, and we will love you back for sure. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. And if you want to follow me, you certainly are welcome to. I post a lot about certainly Go Creative Show, but the work that I do with my production company and just stuff that's going on with me. You can find me at Ben Consoli on Instagram and Twitter at Ben Consoli. Thank you guys for joining us today. And we'll see you next week on another episode of the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. Filmmakers.